Well, hello again, everybody. Um, first, let me start by uh, thanking Ricardo and the team here at Brightline, as well as from PMI. Um, but more specifically, uh, the team, Des and Stuart from Thinkers50, who recommended me to come and spend time with you guys here. And, and the team was nice enough to say yes. So, so I wanted to, to thank them first and foremost for having me. So this presentation is quick. It's 15 minutes. Um, but I'm going to sort of walk through a couple of things. You know, I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, I have the pleasure and benefit of working for Salesforce. And if you step back away from what we do, um, there is no coincidence that we are one of the best places to work in the world globally. Uh, we're the fastest growing enterprise software company. Uh, and also, we are named one of the most innovative companies in the world. Those three things in combination are what make us so powerful. And that is really this sort of journey of culture, as you heard from my uh, panel discussion earlier this morning, I really pivoted toward the people side of transformation and less about the technology. But in this one, I'm also going to pivot one more time. Um, in my book, Growth IQ, one of the very first stats that really set up the entire body of work that I did in that book was something from Bain. And it goes something like this. I'm going to ruin it because it's many sentences long. But the net of it was, for businesses larger than $5 billion, uh, it was in the high 80% range. For businesses smaller than $5 billion, uh, it was in the middle 90% range. That executives felt like the reason they were unable to maintain sustainable growth was internal inertia, not external forces. Outside of black swan events, but I'm talking about really harnessing the power of the culture and how do you change that uh, as I said earlier, you know, sort of change the tires on the car when it's going around the track, especially if it's a Formula One car, where you're going very, very quickly, uh, and you obviously have customers that you're trying to, saw, uh, to serve. And so this combination of things is really what transformed my thinking, and, and now what I get the opportunity to talk about as I, as I travel around the world. So the first one, and I land at, is sort of work is changing. This sort of collaborative, remote workers, the gig economy, there's something, nothing that looks similar to when I started working or when I started selling. Um, I started out as a quota bearing sales rep selling technology some 25 years ago, uh, and I moved up the ranks um, uh, running a division finally at Gateway Computers, for those of you who remember Gateway. Uh, and I got there right as the stores were closing. And we started to move everything into partnerships, selling through Best Buy and CompUSA, which Rita sort of mentioned earlier about how that pivoted and tried to create things um, that we had been pushing for some time. But really where I started to see this change happen was when I spent the decade uh, at Gartner, where we were watching massive organizations struggle with how do they empower their people to work. And this is, yes, it's a technology play. Yes, obviously, from a service and marketing and sales perspective, those are all customer facing. But where we really pivot to is, for us as an organization, is that we don't make decisions about how we work, where we work, what we do, unless there's a customer behind that decision. And so work is really about how do we align ourselves to the goals of our customers, because ultimately, our customer's success drives our success. And so this work-changing conversation is really been highlighted today. You know, dealing with disruptors. How do you do that? How do you do it at what we now say is this pace of innovation and time that is happening? But ultimately, when work changes, we have to think differently about how we hire, how we recruit, how we train, how we onboard, how we create teams, how we measure, how we pay, how we compensate, how we incentivize our, our individuals. But ultimately, it's about making sure that we have equal opportunity across all of these pillars as it relates to the people who work for us every single day. The second one is competition is increasing. There is no question that competition is increasing. And it's coming from everywhere. You know, if you look back in time of whether it's Dollar Shave Club, whether it's Airbnb, whether it's Uber, sort of all the examples that have been given earlier today, one thing lies in common in my mind, right? We want to make it as easy as buying a book on Amazon. <laughs> that changed everything. It was how do we make what we do as easy as buying a book? So the question would be, how many of you in the audience have purchased something from Amazon in the last 30 days? Everybody's hands go up. Now, I would then say, 
How many of you went through the training on how to buy on Amazon? Don't raise your hand, trick question, right? You didn't need it. But what did it teach us? People who bought this bought that. The recommendation engine drives some 30% of all of Amazon.com's revenue. So that then trained us that if we buy this and it needs batteries, it's going to remind us. And you end up leaving Amazon.com with far more than you showed up to buy because it's masterful. It's saying, oh, but you need these three other things. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, let me get it. And if everybody else needs it and they have five stars and now I read reviews and other consumers or businesses are saying that it's similar to me, I then say, okay, I want as well. And then that made its way into the B2B world. How do we create these experiences that we now have in the consumer world and translate that to business? Because if it's going to be harder, it's harder on our employees, a la work is changing, and we will get beat from a competitive standpoint. So this competition increasing is, is that it's coming from everywhere. And that's really the driver of why you would transform. I know this is an age old comment, like ask why. Why are you transforming? Are you transforming to drive down costs? Are you transforming to improve profit? Are you transforming to modernize your data center? Are you transforming to improve employee experience? Are you transforming to improve the experiences your customers have with your company? Like, why are you transforming? And I'm going to go back to the brands that are hype in this hyper growth mode that have really disrupted industries have always done it from a customer experience generated decision making process. We want to deliver these very compelling and easy experiences that string their way through everything that we do. And that is really where the game starts to change. Because customers, we all are now far more empowered in our personal life than we ever have been before. And we don't leave that empowerment when we walk into work. And so if you say work is changing, competition is heightening, and then customers are more empowered, you know, you could say that that is really where the rubber meets the road. Because that is where brands are winning. When I see, you know, in my, in my, my opportunities to travel around the world, so, you know, I probably am, do maybe about 100 of these kinds of events a year somewhere in the world, and I hear these conversations, it's interesting. You hear buckets of where people focus. It's on the back office making streamlining, making us more, much more, far more efficient. Then I'll hear people talk about, well, it's a culture play. Like, what are we going to do? How do we bring our people along this journey? Because we know this is the direction we should be going in. And this third bucket, it is really where I spend a majority of my time is this customer-driven innovation, outside in, listening through the voice of the customer of where and how you can actually have an impact and have really great ideas infiltrate your organization from all kinds of locations. And so I'll just give you an example in our organization. So depending on whether uh, one of our most recent acquisitions goes through, you know, we have 35, 40,000 employees-ish, and um, you know, we're big, and we're growing quickly, and we're expanding globally, and we're getting into new areas and avenues. And I happen to sit in a team that has four key groups. One is analyst relations, which should tell you sort of how I got here, but analyst relations, right? So the Gartners, IDCs, and Foresters of the world. The second one is competitive intelligence, competitive, uh, you know, sort of what's going on in the marketplace. The third one is competitive pricing, sort of, you know, where are we falling on the pricing spectrum and making sure we're staying on top of that. And the fourth team, which is where I sit, is this group of evangelists. All four of those groups are externally facing. The fifth part of our team is called voice of the customer also completely externally facing. We are the canaries in the coal mine. We are the ones that are looking around the corner to hear, well, I was at this conference, I heard these three key themes. If our customers, which many of you are, thank you, right? Many of our customers are concerned about this. How do we help our customers go through this transformation? That actual comment came back to the executive team about two years ago, and now we have stood up an office of innovation to help our customers on this transformation journey of moving from being very product centric to being very customer centric. How do you change the culture? What are things you can learn from what we have done and what others have done? We've helped transform massive organizations from a global scale, watching how others have done it. 
And so that sort of externally focused team that brings that information inside is critical. Now you may say, okay, well your sales force, you're big, 35,000 employees, like how many people are in that team? So the voice of the customer team is 11 people. The evangelist team is five. Competitive intelligence is like nine. Leon may say it's like 20, but it's probably like nine. And then we have uh, competitive insights. It's probably about the same size, and the analyst team is much larger. But when you add that up, let's call it 50 people. So how do you harness all that information that the customers are giving us on a day-to-day -day basis? Global executive briefings, these kinds of conferences, one-on-one -on -one meetings, emails. How do you capture all that and actually put it into the process of are we transforming, are we innovating, are we investing in the right places? Because if it isn't customer driven, why are we doing it? Is it self-serving? Is it all about us? Going back to that Bain stat, this internal inertia, are we not doing it because we're afraid that we've always done it this way? And while we get mentioned often as being very innovative, you know, and one that is cutting edge, we're 20 years old now. So it's not like we're a startup. We're 20 years old, we behave like a startup. It's all driven by this combination of the culture, the customer, driving this massive amount of transformation and innovation, not only for ourselves, but for the, the broader ecosystem, including our partners. Because ultimately, it is driving this transformation and the success externally, because it's very obvious. Look, if you have a sales organization that's a, th a thousand people and you're this size, and we help you grow, and then you have a sales organization that's 1,500 people, who wins in that equation? <laughs> Both of us do. You win, your success is our success. So those three things. So I use us as an example. Um, I wasn't going to, but because a lot of the questions this morning I saw going up and down were sort of how do we do it, I wanted to make sure that I tied that in because those three things are really critical to the success matrix. And so at the end of the day, this is the other thing we hear. Look, I'm an employee. You're telling me to focus on nine firsts. I have all these priorities. It's this crisis of prioritization. What am I supposed to focus on? Am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to get the customer off the phone in a minute and a half? Am I supposed to you know, send out 1,000 emails? What am I supposed to do every single day? And it goes back to the stat I mentioned really quickly that there's some 900 applications in an enterprise, and only 27% of them or so are actually integrated which means we are forcing our employees, our people, the engine of our growth, to hobble through the day to do what? To serve your customers. To serve your customers. Because if your customers aren't happy, they're not gonna buy from you. They might buy from you once, they might not buy from you again. And so ultimately, we have to find a way that if you're pushing for transformation, if you're dealing with massive disruption in the market, if you're trying to deal with new competitors, if you're trying to shift the culture, it's all great in a PowerPoint, but where it has to happen is at each individual contributor, and this is what they're dealing with. We are forcing them to deal with all this technology to help make their lives easier, and we're hearing that it's just making it worse. And so, you know, it was 2001-ish. Um, I was the beta client for Eloqua which is sort of an email marketing tool, and Constant Contact, uh, which, is a, which many of you may use from a newsletter perspective. 2001, back then when I was the beta client, there was like four or five other companies that looked like that. There are 7,600 marketing technology products that get tracked today, 7,600. Like there's not a shortage of technology. And I go back to the fact that this is about people, this is about process. This is about transforming in a way that your people can absorb it, can respond to it, because otherwise they don't know uh, where to focus. Maybe? So we can't afford to slow down. So you've got competition, you've got people, you've got changing of work, overwhelmed amount of technology that can solve this. We have to figure out what are the things you need to do. So the first is sort of building this culture of action, but it can't just be hard charging without the right metrics to allow your people to fail, learn, and iterate. I cannot stress that enough. If you don't have metrics that actually track failures as well as successes, then what you're telling your people is they can never fail. 
Otherwise, you have this culture of stagnation. We've always done it this way, so we'll keep doing it this way. We tried it five years ago. It didn't work, so we're not going to try it again. Or that's not what our competition is doing, so that's not what we're going to do. You have to find your way to this culture of action. You have to create a way in which your people can be successful. And here's sort of four quick steps. You know, I could obviously, many of us could talk about this all day, but here are the four. It's about being connected, working anywhere, anytime. It's about empowering your people to do what's right for your business and for your customers and for other employees. About collaborating across the aisle in different groups and organizations and breaking down those silos and threading data between it. And then obviously innovating. Those four things, while easy to put on a slide, are very difficult to do simultaneously and at scale. So with that, I think uh, the last lessons I'll leave you is we have to figure out how to break down these barriers. Functionality has to outweigh the, outweigh the norm. You've got to think about what are the things. Define the purpose. Why are you doing it? Why is it important? What are the things that people will get by doing it? And making these personal transformations. And I know you're going to hear from Whitney Johnson later, and she's masterful at sort of, you have to disrupt yourself if you're willing to disrupt the business. And be engaged and lead by example. It starts with this room. Our stories and our experiences help shape the direction and be sort of the true north for the people uh, as they go through their own compass of development. So with that, make it fun. So I hope you have enjoyed um, this quick session uh, that I've done. And once again, thank you to the team for having me. Um, and for all of you who are Salesforce clients, I thank you for being our clients. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you uh, in the remainder of the day. Thank you very much.